Your question is a correct question, and it's an important question. And it starts with a theoretical notion. That's why I use the analogy with uh, CT scans and MRIs, because they've solved certain problems. There was, when I studied medicine, I don't know how to pronounce it in English, planigrams, where you had different angles and then you overlay them uh, in x-rays in order to get some better resolution. That was it. That was it. And then CT ca stand scans came and MRIs and they clearly solved problems. The question is, did they increase the health of the Australian or the Dutch population? Is a very difficult one, but they solved problems. So what I want to focus on is well, what problems are we are actually trying to solve and why are these problems and where's the evidence that these are problems? Because I have to admit that our discipline, medical education, has had its fads and it has had its, oh, here's a nice solution, but we haven't got a problem to it. And this is the other way around. <laughs> it's like politicians, isn't it? It says, we've got a solution, but there is no problem uh, associated with it. So I want to uh, talk about what are we trying to solve? What are we, what, what are we trying to fix? And to me, there are two, two sets of issues. One's are more societal changes in society, changes in, in education. By the way, I'm, I'm perfectly happy for my slides to be distributed. Um, you can use them. You can actually attach your name to it, not acknowledge me, use them as your own. But please don't change them and put my name to it. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but it, it, it would be presumptuous for me to, to assume that this is my work. It's the work of many people, and, uh, and I'm just talking about it. Um, so there are societal issues, things perhaps relating to the Australian situation, and there are issues in assessment. And Case has already alluded to some of those issues, but I, I will approach them from a slightly different angle. So the societal issues. First of all, our world is changing. And I actually would like to put to you that the world is changing, the world of education is cha changing as dramatically as 400 years ago. Because 400 years ago, <coughs> the reader emerged, or the lecturer, which is just a, a Latin form of the reader, the reader emerged. And why did the reader come to in, into existence? Because the knowledge was contained in books. But books weren't readily available because producing books was monk's work. It was a lot of work and individual letter printing techniques, Gutenberg's techniques, weren't developed yet. So the reader had the knowledge and read to the students and that's how you were educated. And even when I studied medicine <coughs> in a problem-based, very religious problem-based, self-directed student-centered learning, it was still the universities who controlled the affordances for my learning. It was the universities who controlled which lectures I could attend, which books I could read, which practical models, anatomy models I could use, which dis dissection cadaver cadavers I could use, etc., etc. They controlled the affordances of my learning. Nowadays, if my students don't like my lecture, they go online <laughs> and find a better one. And it's an amazing change, and it's a fundamental change, because um, you probably all had to do some sort of tinkering in the house or at the car, and you say, oh, I don't know how to do it. And then you go online, find a YouTube video of somebody who presents it to you. I find that revolutionary because formerly we would ask a neighbor for help and the neighbor would know us, we would pose a request and the neighbor would help us. Nowadays people put help online for people they don't know and they haven't even been asked for that help and they're still putting that help online. That's amazing. So if our students don't like my lecture, they'll go online and find a better one. So we have to change our education to cater to a, a group of students who can actually get all the information, whether it's rubbish or relevant information, but they can access all of it. That's fundamentally different to the reader, whereas our lecturing system is still based on the notion of the reader. And no wonder that our students are saying, what am I paying my hex fee for? I can't find a better lecture than the university. So the university becomes certification institutes. 
Actually, it's not only that. Our patients have the same affordances. And we make the joke of Dr. Google walking into the door, but Dr. Google will continue to be walking into the door. And if we don't educate our students to deal with Dr. Google, who are who's going to be ever more savvy, we're not doing a good job. So that world is changing. The second one is that what was considered the safe and independent doctor 20 years ago when I graduated is no longer the safe and independent doctor now. Now I graduated and it was the anatomy and physiology knowledge and the pathology and the internal medicine and the surgery knowledge, etc. Uh, being a little specialist in all the disciplines, that was considered the safe and independent doctor. Nowadays, the collaborator, the interprofessional uh, uh, task performer, etc., the financial manager, you have to be a financial manager nowadays, uh, the project manager, all these things are important in ensuring that you're safe and independent. So the traditional view on assessment is you study and we as educators will equip you with all the skills and knowledge and abilities and competencies and whatever work you like to use that will last you for a lifetime. And of course you have to do some CPD uh, or CME, but basically we've given you everything and that is no longer true. We will give you, we will have to educate you in a way that you can continue to learn. That there will be an educational continuing starting on day one of medical school and ending at day Z before retirement. And that continuum will have to go on. So if we never allow you to take agency, if you, we never allow the learners to take agency of their own learning, to be in control of their own learning and their own assessment, they're not going to magically transform when we hand them a piece of paper. So that has to be built in. That's a problem that we have to deal with. Thirdly, and Case has already alluded to it, and it's a, it's a very important point because medicine has evolved from being a rather technical discipline to a more humanistic discipline. And uh, some authors argue that medicine uh, has lost its social contract. Medicine, having been seen as a profession which um, was allowed to do things, after all, we are allowed to stick needles in people and to cut people open and, and, and ask silly questions. We, we're allowed to do that as long as we're seen as a profession that's self-regulating and self-cleansing. And that social contract has been lost somewhat. That's why issues like communication, interprofessional education, teamwork, collaboration, professional boundaries, professionalism are much higher on the agenda in medical education because that's where the complaints come from. Complaints rarely come from not knowing where the pro what the origo and insertion of the pronatoterus muscle are. I probably mispronounced that. When I moved to Australia, I lost my jargon, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> so, and we've, we've understood much more that not everything in medicine is a so-called linear dynamic system. There is not always, one, there's not always one pathway from a problem to a solution. And as you probably know, that every patient needs a bespoke uh, approach. And despite the guidelines, the guidelines are just an anchor, but every patient is an individual situation, and every educational situation is an educational situation. That's why Case already said, what works in one context doesn't work in another context. What works for one patient may not work for another patient. And we've come to understand much better how that complexity works in education, and I'll, I won't digress too much about it. So the safe independent uh, doctors need to be able to self-regulate in a true sense. They need to be able to find information about their strengths of weakness, to compare that with their self-image, to analyze that and to turn that into learning activities that will actually constantly improve them. <coughs> I already said there is a need for agency and empowerment of the learner. Stephen Billet talks about the so-called agentic learner, the person who's in control of their own learning. And being in control of your own learning and your own situation is incredibly important. 
specifically in terms of burnout. Burnout doesn't happen and lack of well-being doesn't happen because you're busy. I would probably case would have been burnt out every day. I would have been burnt out every day because we're so busy. It's because of lack of control, lack of agency of the situation. Everything is happening to you and you have absolutely no power. So with having that assessment student-centered and making the student responsible, and it's not in a soft way, it's, it's, it's in a real responsible and accountable way, Ta building them up with taking agency over their own assessment, gradually taking more agency over their own assessment, you contribute to the empowerment of students because change of the organization is not going to solve this problem. Um, and if we think about assessment, we often think in s very simplistic reward and punishment uh, principles. And this is the old behaviorist model, stimulus, organism, response, and consequence, and that's how you model behavior. And then you've got four tools, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, and negative punishment. Positive reinforcement, you do something I like, I'll do something you like. Negative reinforcement, you do something I like, I'll take away something that you don't like. Positive punishment, you do something I don't like, I do something you don't like. Back, you slap on the wrist. Negative punishment, you do something I don't like, I'll uh, take away something that you like. If you don't finish your plate, you won't get dessert. That's negative punishment. So, but that's a very limited toolkit. And it actually doesn't work that well in complexity, in, in more complex and creative organizations. And as you probably know, if you're in research, impact factors don't really drive your intrinsic motivation, or H in the cheese, or any managerial metric doesn't drive your intrinsic motivation as a researcher. So, uh, and there's a whole field, and I'm just discovering that field, and it's an amazing field of behavioral economics. And one, only one of the many studies, and the, the, the field has already started in 1960s. Glucksberg has already done studies in the 1960s. But here's a more recent one by, by Gnezi and Rossuccini in, in Israel, where they wanted to see what punishment does. How can we model behavior with punishment? And what they did is they had child daycare centers. And of course, pickup time is rush hour for child daycare centers. And Pick up, late pickups are a problem because if, it, if uh, parents are late in picking up the children, then one of the teachers has to stay behind and wait until the final parent comes and picks up the piece. And teachers see that as their role, but they're not very happy about it. So Canizzi and Rossuccini thought, what would happen if we put a punishment on late pickups? So they had a punishment of roughly 10 shekel, roughly the equivalent, I think, of $5. Australian, uh, on every 10 minutes that you were late in pick up and every event. And they advocate, uh, advertised that and they did it with half of the daycare centers. They put in the punishment and the other ones they didn't. And this is the baseline measurement. So on average, you had around eight to 10 late pickups per week. And this is what happened after they set, put the punishment. The late pickups tripled. And the reason was quite simple. Before that, there was a bit of a social con contract. If you were late as a parent, you felt awkward. Oh, I'm so sorry, sorry, I oh, know, rush hour, etc. But now you're just paying for it. <laughs> now it's a fee for service. And that's actually what, what parents said. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I'm 10 minutes late, but I'll, I'll, I'll pay the fee. Who cares? So punishment and reward, and the same work for reward. There is a beautiful candle. Uh, problem exercise or creative exercise. If you reward people and ask them to be quicker in, f in solving the problem and you, you put some monetary reward to it, they actually slow down. It's, it's, it's very unpredictable. Uh, so reward doesn't work the way we think. Small tangible rewards actually decrease intrinsic motivation, but the verbal rewards, the feedback, increase motivation. It's not in the money, it's not in the H in the cheese, not in the impact factors, not in, in what have you. It is in the verbal rewards. And if you breach a social contract, it will take you an immense time to gain it back. And I was told 
a story about one of the universities that actually put lawyers onto the students for trying to memorize items of the test. Well, that's a breach of social contact that you will never get back again. If you put lawyers on your students, onto your students, you're basically saying, we hate you. And we think that you students are the enemy. And you're just here to pay and be silent and not take any action. And that contract will take years and years and years to, to, uh, to be mended. Because in the end, what you try to do is be on the same page because educators and students have the same remit, namely to produce good doctors. Now, in Australia, government is clearly becoming impatient. And it's, it might be my reading, my impression, but I get the impression that the government is seeing a breach of social contract. And that's where the Woods Review comes from. The Woods Review basically, to me, says there are a couple of issues we're unhappy with. The term cost recovery basis features a zillion times. You're too expensive. The new technology and pedagogical approaches features several times. We think you're outdated. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the fact that they want to, that they're suggesting to have one central organization overseeing the quality assurance of the colleges, the vocational training, and the, and the AMC shows that we have no trust in your self cleansing ability. So, there is, to me, this reads as a social contract breach or a perception of social contract breach. And it will be very interesting to see what we're going to do about that to retain our part in that social contract. Because as we all know, if regulations kick in, things don't necessarily improve. So that's the societal part. The technical part is, is, is a bit easier. Uh, first of all, there is, an <coughs> there is an element of reductionism in the way we approach assessment. If this is a test, let's say it's a multiple choice test, and here are the answers given by one on, on six items given by one of the students. What I can see is, the, of course, the student has made a couple of mistakes. Uh, three, four, five, and six are incorrect answers, but I know which answers were given. So I know the quality of the mistakes or the errors being made. If I compare that to an answer key and, conf and um, translate every of those errors into a zero or a one, I now have reduced the quality of that information. I simply know to which items an incorrect answer was given. Then I calculate a total score. Now I've lost the information as to which specific items were answered incorrectly. I only know how many items were answered incorrectly. And then I compare that to a cutoff score, and now I've lost the information to how many items were answered incorrectly, only were sufficiently items answered correctly and incorrectly. So I've dichotomized that rich information to a, a, a zero, one score. And some, of course, Richard Dawkins would argue that reductionism is a good thing, and uh, one of my favorites, Sir Douglas Hofstadter, would argue it's not necessarily a good thing. But there are issues with reducing information. There are concerns and, and, and risks in reducing information. And one is comes from uh, current validity theory, so theory about how do we know that we're measuring what we're trying to measure, Mike Cain. And Mike Cain said, says that the very important part in, in validity is from observation to score. So when you, for example, when you take a blood pressure or when, when a student takes a blood pressure, we hope that they've used the right cuff, that they know how to manage the sphygmo manometer, that they uh, put, know how to manage the stethoscope, put them on the right place, that they recognize carotid cuff tones, et cetera, et cetera, and that they run down the <coughs> column quickly enough to record 120 or 80. The um, point then is if any of these things is not uh, in order or if any of these things is not okay, the 120 over 80 becomes useless information. So there are a lot of assumptions in that reduction that we have to ensure before we can actually say this is your score. 
Reduction without reason is meaningless. If I give you that you scored a 4 out of 10 and you don't know what a 4 out of 10 means or how to get to a 6 out of 10 or an 8 out of 10, it's a meaningless reduction. And meaningless reduction, meaningless information doesn't lead to feedback. I used to play volleyball uh, when I was younger and certainly when I started to play competition volleyball, sometimes I could, could get coaching like, you're the free net defender. Come on, you're the free net defender. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> so why didn't they just tell me, go further back or come closer? So um, if, I, if I have no information, I can't give you meaningful feedback. And Ericsson has done a lot of studies and, 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 and sweep together a, a bunch of studies. Without feedback, learning is just not as effective. And it comes back to the sports and the musical coach metaphor. I, I once gave a presentation to all the representatives of student bodies and I asked them, how many of you play a musical instrument? And a couple of arms went up. And how many of you play competitive sports? A couple of, I'll use this one. A couple of other hands went up. So I said, and how would you see it if your coach were to say, or your music teacher would constantly say, oh, that went okay. Yeah, that wasn't too bad. And they would say, no, they never say it. So why do you accept it from your coach who coaches you in something that you're going to do for 40 years for the rest of your life, probably 60 to 80 hours a week, and at which you want to excel? Why do you take that nonsense feedback? So if we want to learn, we need feedback. And Ericsson shows that with deliberate practice, you, you reach higher levels more quickly um, than if you're not being given feedback. Of course, many people, we've all received a, a certain or a, a achieved a certain level of expertise simply by teaching ourselves and doing it ourselves, but it could have been more effective even. Even if you say, but our remit is not education. Our remit is just testing. Let's say you're just <coughs> testing IMGs. Well, even then, there's still the issue of giving feedback. Let's say you've got a test and a retest, and nothing happens in between. You do not give feedback. Well, we know, and you all know as diagnosticians, that the prevalence of the disease or the prior probability is the, the most important factor in determining the post-test probability, or the positive and negative predictive values are very strongly uh, influenced by the prevalence of the disease and far less of the sensitivity and specificity of the test. So if you test somebody and do not give feedback and just give them a retest, you've actually done nothing to increase that prior probability. So your post and uh, post test probabilities, your positive and negative predictive values will just be the same. And I think it was Einstein who said it's foolish to put the same things into a system, have the same process and expect a different outcome not going to happen. So feedback, even if you're just testing, feedback is important. Arbitrariness, there's a lot of arbitrariness in our system. We have cutoff scores which are often based on the implicit assumptions. It needs to be 60% and it's never 58.743%. It's always a nice round figure and that's amazing that it's always a nice round figure but it's probably because we simply don't like 57.843%. It's not because 58.743% is a bad number. We don't like it, so we'll turn it into 60. But every percent change has impact on pass fail rates and therefore impact on students' careers. Then we've got the typical assessment program. So you've got your, your block, unit, module, topic, whatever you want to call it, which is capstone by, a, by a, a, a test. If you pass, you go on to the next unit. If you pass, you go on to the next unit. If you fail, you do a retest or you redo the unit, etc. And in the end, we have to combine those pass-fail. So here we've got two, four, five data points, yes, no, pass-fail, into competence. And there is again arbitrariness because we say, well, this counts for 30%, never for 28.743%. <laughs> always oh, just 30% or 5%, nice round figures, and just do some mathematical mumbo-jumbo, and now we've got competence. 
That's a lot of arbitrariness in the system. And personally, I don't like arbitrariness. And sometimes we have to accept it. I mean, the, the, pay, if the P less or equal to 0 0.05, why is it 5%? Because Fisher had to select one. So he chose 5%, and not 4%, and not 6%, just chose 5 So there's always arbitrariness, but in an assessment program, we would like to reduce it as much as possible, come to a well-thought-through, well-supported decision, like you would do as a clinician. Learning effects, Keith already alluded to it, but there is good research, and this is just, learning effects are complex, um, a simple behaviorist model doesn't work and sometimes gives unexpected uh, consequences. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't find one from um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where they say that mice are used to steer human beings by running through mazes. They can steer, steer human behavior. But um, it's a complex phenomenon. and It's not the, the person who interprets the punishment or reward or the activities actually is important because they decide what they want. And I've got this lovely cartoon, which I didn't use, of a bunny that says, I like carrots. And next to it is a beaver, I prefer sticks. So what's a carrot and a stick for one is not a carrot and a stick <laughs> for the other. <laughs> uh, and we know that a hurdle jump is actually the least effective way of learning. And this is just one of the many studies looking at what's better a hurdle jump learning, or some people would call it the bulimia approach to learning, so partying for a while, not doing much, then cramming for the exam, and then not doing much and cramming for the exam, mm -hmm. or continuous learning. And this is just one of the studies, or also a couple of studies in, in medical education, and it shows that continuous learning leads to better attention, quicker attention, better attention, and better access to what you've learned afterwards. So I don't know why my university insists on having so-called SWOT facts. So one or two weeks vacation before the test so that you can cram for the test. It's actually institutionalizing something which is contrary to the evidence. <laughs> and it's not evidence at all. <coughs> then the final two points, prediction and weakness. We are in a situation where you have a certain span of control about what our students, our learners do, but we try to predict what they are going to do afterwards. And a one point measurement is never a good predictor. I mean, everybody in pediatrics knows that if you want to monitor or to predict where a child will end up in terms of weight and, and length uh, and height um, at the age of 18, you do not take just one measurement. You take multiple measurements, you plot, and you look at whether the curve is turning down or sloping upwards, or whether it's a failure to thrive, <coughs> etc. You can't detect a failure to thrive on a one measurement. You can't detect a failure to thrive in terms of competence development on one measurement. And there is another effect. If you're looking at the single measurements and you're not passing them on, you're not handing them over, specifically in issues concerning professionalism and communication behavior, everybody thinks, oh yeah, that was one incident. Oh, should I do something about it? I, I, and, and then you're not allowed to hand it over. But what you're actually doing is, and everybody covers it up, and that's the educational equivalent to suturing a contaminated wound. It looks nice on the outside. And everybody covers up. And underneath there is the osteomyelitis <coughs> happening. And that's, the studies case was alluding to, uh, Maxime Papadakis shows that these people who were in disciplinary measures and litigation involved in their in a, in a professional practice had already been identified at medical school, but nobody wanted to act on it. So a longitudinal handover is extremely important. Well, to, to in the Netherlands, we used a, a, a sort of heuristic that one incident isn't it is an incident, two can be a coincidence, but three, a pattern starts emerging. If you don't measure longitudinally, you won't see patterns. Uh, yeah, well, uh, and then finally, we tend to oversimplify the complex phenomenon of competence. And for me, competence is a phenomenon as complex as health. 
And much as I wouldn't say to my patients, you're 43.7% healthy, I'm not inclined to tell my students that they're 43.7% competent. And health, if you take the WHO definition of health as uh, the total state of well-being, et, et cetera, uh, it goes to show that you can't really pin it down. And it's, it's something that we constantly talk about and negotiate with our patients and that's something which is based on using numerical lab data but also narrative data from the pathologist and radiodiagnosticians etc together with our physical examination and history taking and we bring that together in order to build a story about health it's not a measurement issue and we don't oversimplify health and I think um, we're, we're firmly on the, uh, of the opinion that you shouldn't oversimplify a competent. Um, I'm going to leave it. So in a summary, there are a couple of things societal, the changing world, the changing education, the changing affordance of both our students and our, and our uh, uh, patients. Government actions here specific to Australia at the moment that I think would be very timely to take into account and a couple of issues that we try to solve with respect to things we're not dissatisfied with in assessment. So thank you very much.